Welcome to everybody and thank you for coming this afternoon. My name is Elena Coppola. I'm a CMF designer and I'm also the founder of Green Cabin Alliance. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here today with the very, very eminent panel. Um, so the question is, um, how do we deliver better cabins for people um, and the planet? And it's absolutely critical, as we've heard through the afternoon, to transition to a greener economy for, for the airline industry. And I think what's even more critical is to do this at speed. We've heard of so many solutions this afternoon, so many initiatives, but very few people have talked about the speed, the pace at which this really needs to happen. So that's one of the things that we, we are really looking forward to talk about today, this afternoon. So at this point, I'm going to hand off for a quick introduction of the panel. Then we have Caroline making a presentation, followed by Matthew making a presentation, and then a Q&A with the audience. So over to Kristen. Is this on? Is it's it working? Yeah? Okay, great. Um, so my name is Kristen Allison. I'm the Global Business Development Director for Carbon Smart Chemicals at Lanzatech. Just to give you a quick intro on what is Lanzatech, um, as it's probably new for a lot of you in the room, we are a carbon capture and transformation company. So we capture the emissions from industrial emissions or other waste sources and convert them into new materials and products. We utilize a gas fermentation process that then converts that the, the microbe eats off of the waste carbon from CO2, from CO, and converts that into ethanol at commercial scale. And that ethanol then can be used as a building block for materials and chemicals. Um, and as examples of maybe what would be most relevant to you in the room, um, that ethanol can be used as a building block for polyester fibers. Um, so there we've had launches in the textile space, in the packaging space, but also in automotive for things like um, airbags and seatbelts. Um, so a little food for thought and um, yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Hey guys, uh, I'm Christian, Christian uh, Seifert. I'm uh, from Lufthansa Technik and um, I'm dealing with the development of uh, Aeroflex, um, um, natural fiber composite um, that we um, are in development um, with. And um, also I lead a couple of um, research projects on resource efficiency in the cabin area, as well as uh, other natural um, or bio-based um, materials in that area. That's me. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Caroline Jacob. Thanks for attending this talk and the one next door. <laughs> um, I work for a design agency called Simmer Powell. We're based in London um, and I'll give you a little bit more um, of an intro about the business in a second. Um, but my background is very much uh, within uh, color material and finish as well. I head up the color material and finish team uh, at Simmer Powell. Um, and I'm working across uh, multiple sectors. Aviation is one of them. And I think um, this is very beneficial to my, my practice um, as I can bring some cross-pollination from other industries into aviation. So good to see you all here. And last but not least, I'm Matthew Nichols from Tapis Corporation. So uh, I, we, we make synthetic leather uh, with our partners, uh, Ultrafabrics. Um, I'm a sort of materials nerd, really, I suppose. Um, I'm one of only a small group of people that has a sort of postdoc degree in leather science, which is just really weird. Um, uh, and then my, my buddy, who's my partner at work, he has a PhD in, in textiles engineering, which is even weirder. So we're quite, quite, quite the couple. Um, but yeah, I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about sort of some of the new novel materials that are coming into the landscape. What are they? What do they do? What do they mean? How can we integrate them and use some of their really interesting innovations potentially in a, in a more sustainable uh, cabin environment? But we'll talk about more about that in a minute. Thank you to the panel. So now, Caroline, thank you for taking the stand. So hopefully this, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so we're today talking about um, cabin, the cabin interior and how that are, how we can make it a better environment for people um, and for the planet. Um, so at Simmerpal, we're a 40 year old design and innovation uh, agency working across um, uh, global uh, markets, but also different industries. Um, and this has been our mantra since 90, uh, 1984. Uh, we believe that great design makes things better 
better for people, uh, better for business, and better for the world. Um, and as, as I was putting this presentation together, I came across this uh, very old photo of our two founders, uh, Dick Powell on the right and Richard Seymour on the left, um, who back in the 90s, I don't know um, who is um, uh, from the UK in the room, but back in the 90s, um, were the, the sort of star of a TV show called Better by Design. And um, this was very much part of, this is very much part of our DNA, how we can utilize uh, design to make things better. Um, and at the time, they were working on an airline um, seat for Swiss Air, and um, believe it or not, uh, we're trying to make it lighter already um, back in the 90s. So um, just I thought it was a nice, nice one to share. I'm not sure Rich looks very comfortable in that, <laughs> in that seat there. Uh, um, but yeah, I thought, I thought it was a nice one to bring to the, to the panel. Um, here you will see some of the, the or a brief overview on um, how the work we do takes from um, form in the mobility sector, um, from creating passenger experiences for future astronauts, um, for Virgin Galactic, or envisioning robotic support staff for transportation terminals, which we see on the right hand side there, um, to crafting interior that evokes um, a brand's values, um, such as the flea to get experience uh, that you see here at the bottom left. Uh, but here, here we are. Um, I've, I had gathered quite a lot of statistics today, and um, I'm sure a lot of them have been already said across the different panels today. So I'm going to weave through some of those pages. Um, but we know that today, um, emission from aircraft of operations account for roughly 3% of global carbon emission. Um, but this is expected to um, rise by 300% um, by 20. 2050 if we left um, the sector unchecked. So how do we make sure we get um, on the journey to um, sustainability um, and avoid reaching um, uh, that increase? Well, I guess the truth is we're all at different stages of our um, journey to net zero. Um, and the, the important message to get across today is no matter where you're on that journey, uh, the importance is to get started. <laughs> So while some of us are still kind of doing business as usual, um, others have started talking about um, sustainability, um, circularity, obviously uh, Boeing and Airbus share their circular uh, vision earlier today, uh, and um, some more maybe progressive or some business that are a bit more far ahead in their journey um, already looking at regenerative design. And I don't know, some of you might not know exactly what regenerative design is, but it's a design that uses all system thinking to create resilient and equitable systems that integrate the needs of society with the integrity of nature. So it goes really beyond being sustainable and circularity. Um, it's about giving back to nature. Um, so I'm pretty sure most of you will agree um, this is where we are at, or this is where the focus uh, of the industry is today. We're either doing business as usual, talking about green, or trying to be as sustainable. But what we need really is for the industry to move to this later part of the journey and become circular in the next five years. Um, if we can get there, then there are great chances that those that are already applying circular principles um, today will be regenerative by tomorrow. And the cabin is one of the most difficult part of an aircraft to apply circular economy principles to. Um, accounting for a high proportion of the material from aircraft recycling uh, that is then sent to landfill and, and or being incinerated. Um, but many of the opportunities for increasing circularity uh, require intra-sector um, and cross-sector uh, partnership that are currently underdeveloped. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're here today together within that panel. So how do we unpack this challenge? Um, the truth is, it is quite complex, and there's a lot of um, jargon that needs to be um, unpacked to be able to have, um, um, and I think Elena speaks a lot about this in the Green, uh, in the Green Alliance. There is no common language uh, or understanding of what um, the issue is, and this is very much what we need to do uh, now, is uh, agree on that common language, agree on those standards, agree on those regulations, so we can move forward and um, at pace. Um, so at Simmer Powell, we believe that um, 
if we want to drive positive change, we need to adopt those four mindsets. Um, and this is very much an adaptation of, um, some of you might be aware of the double diamond, which is a model developed by the Design Council um, uh, in the UK to help inform system de systemic design approach. Um, and the first mindset or principles, if you like, is um, about being multiple, multidisciplinary um, um, and uh, within collaboration. So I think we talked a lot about this today across the different panels, but uh, we believe bringing various experts from various industries um, uh, can broaden the knowledge and facilitate a, a more productive creative space. Storytelling and engagement is also key. People love being told stories. Um, so we need to use emotional levers to create optimis optimism, empathy, um, and buy-in. System thinking, probably one of the most important mindset to adopt for us, um, which is about this notion of zooming in and out of a problem to connect the dots and see the bigger picture. Um, Dick Powell, our founder, always speaks about the importance of stepping out of a brief to be able to come at it better uh, when he does his innovation speeches. And finally, designing and making, um, using our innovation process and creativity to sketch, build, test, and make things real. Um, we don't want things to stay at a concept stage. We want them to come, come in front of the passengers and uh, become real. Uh, now, one of the things we, we um, use the most, or we find very useful um, in our approach, is to balance the pull, what we call the push and pull factors. So push is what um, businesses uh, need to do in order to achieve their sustainability goals, whilst the pull is what consumers want and care about when it comes to sustainability. Now, we often hear or get asked, but really, passenger, do they care about it? Or which part of the world do they care most about, or how important is it for them? Uh, well, there is clear evidence that people mindset are shifting. Um, back in 2019, uh, Maria, our for, uh, director of foresight, was here to present um, some of the research that we had done um, around uh, the US, Brazil, um, China, Germany, and the UK. Um, and we found that 61% of nomadic businesswomen feel guilty about the ecological impact of their business trip and the level of waste they generate. Now, um, we see that this, um, this is uh, the evidence that the problem uh, continue, or the mindset um, continues to shift. And there is this more recent study from uh, Booking.com that shows 71% of global holidaymakers want to make a great effort to travel more sustainably. Um, so how do we do it and why now? Why, um, why are we p uh, putting greater emphasis on, on the cabin? And I think, again, this has been raised in previous panels, but some of you might not have attended those panels, so I'll just give you a reminder. Um, so in a future where hydrogen aircraft um, emits no carbon dioxide, the proportional significance of uh, non-operational emission becomes far greater. So you don't have the 90 to 95% um, carbon emission generated by your operational uh, 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 emissions. And so the carbon, uh, carbon impact becomes far greater. And whilst those 10% still uh, feels a bit uh, maybe minor to some of you, the impact is significant with tens of thousands of tons of materials consumed and reduced uh, to waste each year. Um, so in this session, we'll very much focus on um, looking at design, um, manufacturing, usage, and maintenance, but also end-of-life scenarios. Um, the cabin is responsible for a significant proportion of an airliner impact. We talked a lot about re retrofitting today. Um, it's good to know that um, uh, the cabin is replaced four to five times during the life of, of an airframe. Um, so how can we implement better retrofit systems that tap into more circular or regenerative uh, practices? Uh, materials is a huge part um, uh, or is a key consideration in the pursuit of more sustainable cabin products, um, especially as it is uh, intrinsically linked to design. So not only um, it is a factor in driving a product's weight, um, but it also carries its ability to embody circular design principles. 
Um, and when considered in isolation, materials have um, inherent sustainability characteristics, uh, such as um, uh, resistance to biodegradation or uh, toxicity, um, the energy that it requires to, uh, for extraction, processing, transportation, um, you name it. And so how do we accelerate sorry, an, uh, uh, a process which can take decades to play out? Well, we need radical innovation um, to build business cases that have the right impact, but also um, drive the ambition to provide the space for innovation to take off. And for that, we need to extract more materials from waste and to do it faster. So um, at Simrapal, we developed a series of um, uh, proprietary tools um, that we use to accelerate systemic change. And I'm going to dive into the sustainable CMF index with you today, um, as we felt this is uh, one of the key uh, challenges the industry is, is in need of. Um, so what it is, um, it is a practical framework that provides guidance and clarity to stakeholders looking to implement sustainability. Um, and in the next few slides, we'll share with you this, the sort of uh, principles and thinking underpinning this framework. Um, so first, um, what that, what is that, what's that met methodology looking like? Um, well, for every brief, uh, because they're all very different, um, we think it's worth stating with some key question um, to establish that push and pull approach. So, you know, it may be what are your sustainability goals, but also what is the scale of the projects? Where, where is the aircraft going to be dismantled? Uh, what are we, who are we targeting? Um, what is um, the supply chain? And this is also where we like to uh, invite some um, experts from across different industries to bring, to widen and broaden that, that knowledge. Um, then we go on a research phase where we map out everything and see how everything is, is, might be connected. Um, we identify the roots of the problem, which is, I think, we were discussing that earlier, maybe one of the things that aviation hasn't really put a, a, a foot on. What is the root of the problem? Um, or what are the roots of the problems? Um, and then designing goals such as reducing the impact of material extraction or enabling reuse, facilitating disassembly. And against that, we, we can then develop system map and evaluation criteria that are brought to life with case studies, as you can see here. Um, and then we go about mapping it, mapping it out so um, it doesn't feel too daunting. Um, and we found that the more effective approach is to consider the opportunities for realizing the lowest impact solutions first. So say with, um, uh, reusing products, for example. Um, and then gradually moving towards the higher impact options um, and looking at maybe more regenerative practices, for example. And then it's all about designing and making, um, using our, um, our innovation uh, process of sketching, building, um, testing, making, but also um, um, it is key at that stage to conduct a life cycle analysis um, to understand and compare uh, the different com concepts and uh, scenarios. Now, the other side of the, the CMF index uh, uh, tool is a resource um, which gathers sustainable um, and trusted sustainable CMF solutions that we can implement um, within different uh, uh, supply chains. Um, what we uh, have found useful is to identify um, key target areas um, that help create sustainable CMF design. And each client and project will have their own you know, key focus. And so those icons that you see here um, are very much um, a, a way of helping us navigating through uh, material properties and the priorities of your business. So some of, it, some of the materials will be um, focusing on um, low carbon uh, or weight redu reduction, and others will be um, uh, looking at biofabrication, for example. So let's dive in. Um, I've selected uh, 10 case studies or solutions from our index that are fairly uh, readily available um, to look at the, how we can reduce uh, the carbon footprint uh, within the carbon. Um, uh, the first one is um, um, about regenerative, or about generative design, um, and 
I know we talk a lot about lightweight within seats, but um, incremental weight reduction is, is not only about seats. It's about looking at all the different materials within the cabin and see how we can push beyond the current challenges of, um, um, what, of, of an industry that is quite mature and optimized already. And so um, sometimes price sensitivity can be um, a limit to apply new technologies which might deliver significant weight saving. And this is often the case with um, looking at um, additive manufacturing. And this is quite an old example from um, a collaboration between Autodesk and Airbus, um, who partnered back in 2019 and developed a whole new uh, panel design, uh, looking at bionic designs. Um, and through this uh, uh, development programs, they managed to reduce 45% of the weight of the side panel. Um, Price sensitivity, sensitivity sometimes comes from novelty, um, and the quicker we can adopt some of those uh, new technologies, the qu quicker we can uh, get the, the cost to, to plateau and may, maybe become more competitive with um, uh, more traditional uh, material solutions. So um, I think it's quite interesting to look at e-leather, who's been a player in the aviation sector for quite some time. And if you look at their case studies, e-leather uh, managed to really become uh, a more uh, cost-effective solution by partnering with the fashion, um, a fashion brand, uh, Nike, um, and use their knowledge uh, within uh, the sportswear industry to really develop uh, the products and the materials in a way that is um, becoming much more efficient for aviation. Um, less is more. I've heard that a couple of times today as well. Um, we know that certification developments need to um, often tend to increase pressure um, or add weight or discourage cabin OEMs from taking risk in introducing new technologies, um, sometimes forcing them to rely on proven designs, technologies or materials um, that um, have maybe more negative uh, sustainable credentials. But what what we've, um, we thought uh, was uh, good to consider is, um, and that's one of the examples that we brought in here, is maybe sometimes it's about doing less. Um, so I quite like this um, new collection, collection from Target, but I know Botany Weaving has done similar um, uh, technology where they looked at not using any dyes in some of their products and uh, in some of the yarns of their carpets. And by um, just having less processes involved in, their de in the development of their materials, they were really able to, to cut out uh, some of the toxicities, water usage, um, and the, 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 um, the sort of total carbon used on their technologies. Uh, but also, I think it's quite interesting to look at, um, if you see the top image, how um, goat hair can become a, a kind of key feature or characteristics of, of their materials and bring that unique um, uh, quality to the material. Data sharing um, is also quite important um, uh, and is a significant, significant barrier to um, uh, implementing circularity within the cabin interior. Um, uh, we talked a lot about, about data in general and we need uh, a greater collaboration from suppliers um, but also from uh, um, you know, airlines, seat manufacturers to be able to share uh, greater data um, uh, about the materials that they use and the source, but also the energy that they use to produce them. So how can we make data more identif identifiable, um, shareable, but also easier to analyze? Because that's another, um, another complexity within, within that challenge. Um, and I thought it was quite interesting to bring this example from, again, from the fashion industry, but it feels so easy to transfer over the aviation sector. Um, it's um, um, it's a company called Sh uh, Sheep um, Included, and they uh, developed a technology uh, looking at NFC uh, to uh, track where the material comes from all the way to the, the actual sheep that has been used uh, to knit their jumpers. Um, but also what this um, connected dot, or you could call it a material passport does, um, is tell you exactly um, how your um, knit was made, but also um, how much carbon it has embedded in it. And you know, we've got part numbers assigned to each and every materials. Can, surely we can do something similar for aviation. 
Um, so um, another example which I thought was quite interesting, um, and I'm going to stop here um, afterwards because we've got um, um, uh, more technologies to share within the room, is um, an example from the aviation industry, and I think from the automotive industry, sorry. Um, we know that obviously a lot of progress has been made in automotive. A lot of this is due to the regulation that has been implemented within the industry, uh, which enabled us, them to um, grow um, um, uh, more circular initiatives faster. Um, um, but I thought this example was quite interesting on how um, obviously we need for aviation seats to be dismantled uh, much faster. We know that um, if, if a seat can't be dismantled within eight minutes, it is not worth recycling it. Um, it well, it's not economically viable to recycle it. Um, so how can we make this disassembly process much faster and quicker and better um, so we can uh, uh, implement more circular systems um, in, in our programs? Um, this is an example from uh, BMW iVision uh, uh, a car, which developed all uh, uh, seats concepts using mono materials. But also, I think the key the key innovation here is they developed this very quick release fastener that allows every part of the seats to come apart in a matter of a second. And um, I think we really need to start looking at those. It's not only about looking at materials, but it's looking at those systems and looking at things more holistically so we can uh, uh, separate uh, components more, more easily uh, within our um, supply chain. Um, uh, and uh, the last uh, technology that I want to share is um, around um, uh, developing more homogenized uh, designs. So we all know that um, weight, uh, seats, bulkheads, galleys, they represent you know, half of the cabin's weight. Uh, but one of the particular challenges that we have is uh, in reusing those items is that they're heavily branded. You know, some of them have um, customized patterns, special forms. You know, we all develop great visual languages for um, uh, airlines um, uh, uh, developing new, new seats. Um, color material and finish is also an issue in that sense. We all have to, every, br every brand has a different color scheme. So how can we maybe look at um, seat designs or cabin designs or materials that could um, uh, be more easily customizable, not only from a passenger perspective, but from a retrofitting perspective? And I thought this uh, concept that Evian uh, shared last year at AIX was quite interesting, um, looking at how you can um, uh, bring more customization panel within the seats. And therefore, uh, and maybe it wasn't their message at the time, but therefore enable uh, repurposing uh, products when retrofitting uh, the cabin. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna skip through maybe a couple more because I think we want to hear the whole panel talking. Um, and we've got three, three great technologies that are part of the index that we're really keen to have on stage to, today. Um, the first one um, uh, is from Tapis. Uh, we'll then look at Aeroflux um, from Lufthansa Technique and then uh, Lanzatex technology around um, carbon. Thank you, Caroline. That was brilliant. Um, we'll do a quick Hand over to Matthew. Right, Thank you. Good. And you're going to give me a cue when you want me to you might need support to you. Switch. Oh, yeah. I'm okay. not sure how it works. Tell, Tell me one. Um, so while we get, while we throw up the, uh, oh, there he is. There we go. We're all good. So as we talked about earlier, uh, I'm Matthew Nichols from Tapis Corporation. And as I briefly touched on earlier, um, I, I wasted my kind of juvenile years being a, a tanner's apprentice in, in sunny Italy. Um, and then I became a tanner um, and went back to school and did a postdoc in, in, in leather science, which, like I said, is kind of weird, to be honest. Um, so the nice thing about all that, though, is it gives me a really unique insight into materials and materiality. Today, I work for Tapis Corporation, um, and we are a partner of Ultra Fabrics. Um, does it go right? Or... Can you remember with the, uh, the clicker? It doesn't seem to be clicking all that great. You know, wrong one, maybe? Uh, which one are we? This one or? 
this one that'll be why it doesn't work i'm supposed to be smart and this reality is not very hang on how does that work just push the button right okay nothing's kind of do you have to point it or what do you am i just like a retard or <laughs> <laughs> No. Everybody else made it work today. I know, right? Oh, here we go. All right, it's, it's, it, sorry, sorry, apologies. Um, so today, what we wanted to talk about, right, was, um, was about materiality. So there's been a lot of question marks um, lately, or, or a lot of questions asked. Actually, we, um, so a, a few months back in, 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 also in Hamburg, we had the Red Cabin Conference. Um, and sustainability was a really big topic uh, at, at that as well. And all of these new novel materials kept popping up. People were talking about, you know, things like cactus leather and mushroom leather and apple leather and any other vegetable that you can think of was, was pretty much in there. And everybody kept asking, hey, you know about materials. Um, what can you tell us about them? Um, and I've had the fortune over the years to kind of have worked with most of those companies. Um, so I have kind of like a, a slightly unique insight. So I thought what we did today is look at some of these new sustainable materials uh, that are coming out that come from the sort of plant-based world. We've actually got some samples here that we're gonna hand out and run through. These are not our samples, but um, it, it, it stimulates conversation because when we start talking about things like pineapple leather, people kind of scratch their heads and go, how can you make leather out of a pineapple, right? Well, seeing is believing. So we're gonna show you some stuff so you can actually feel what it's like. Um, a little bit about us first. So Tapis, we're based in New York, uh, as is our partner, Ultra Fabrics. Um, together, uh, we support the aircraft interiors industry. So we make synthetic leather and synthetic suede and supply that into the aircraft interiors industry. If you've flown on a plane in America, you've probably sat on our stuff at some point. Um, we'll be at the show, obviously, all week. So if you want to learn a little bit more about us, by all means, come, come and see us. So... <coughs> What we're going to do is these, these kind of new uh, kind of novel products, what the aim of today really is just kind of like give you a little bit more information. So everybody always asks us questions about what are they, how are they built, what are they made from, uh, and hopefully today we'll kind of have a little, a little chat through about how, about how that works. Um, materials are a really important part of the cabin, and we need to be thinking consciously about kind of what impact uh, they play on our environment. Um, what I think is a little strange is that maybe two or three years ago, it wasn't really on anyone's radar and almost overnight, people started talking about sustainability for materials and how does it impact into the cabin. I think people were maybe just focused super intensively on things like SAF and they figured that out and now they're talking about cabin interior materials. It, it was like next on the list, it seems like, because it kind of came almost overnight. Um, so today we're going to talk about what role materiality plays. Um, it really kind of started in the EV industry. Um, so there was a famous um, South African gentleman that runs an EV company, uh, and he kind of coined the term vegan leather. We did not come up with that idea. That was, that was all, um, all, all, of, all of him, really. Um, so we, we do supply a certain EV company in California uh, with some white stuff that you can see on the screen. Um, that really was probably the biggest leader of those kind of materials. And if you go back kind of 10 years ago, and like someone was talking about earlier in the, uh, in the presentations, people were talking about Range Rovers and all those kind of things, and they would see the ostentatious value in having genuine leather in there. It kind of fitted. Um, but today, the kind of role is reversed. So 10 years ago, people didn't really like synthetic leather. They thought it was, you know, plastic and PVC and things. Um, and today it's seen as a bit of a pioneer in terms of vegan leather. Now, following on behind what we've done, there are now lots of new and alternative people. We talked about pineapple leather and mushroom leather. It seems like every vegetable under the sun has now been made into leather, which is kind of fun. So, um, you know, how do these stack up? What, are, what is their relationship? What are the differences? How are they built? I get asked that like kind of every week. So to start off with genuine leather, what, what we did was we put a little, little sketch together and we kind of broke them down into their core components to make it kind of a little bit more simple. So what we have with genuine leather is we have a PU top coat, right? So the A surface layer is generally a polyurethane top coat with maybe a texture embossed into the surface typically. Now you can of course have natural aniline type products uh, but for use in an aircraft interior or a car interior, typically it's going to be a pigmented PU top. Then the substrate, right? So the substrate is, in this instance, is simply an animal hide. That hide has been taken off 
the animal. So a lot of people will talk about the leather industry as being the ultimate recycler of products. <coughs> leather, of course, uh, comes from a cow. Um, cows are not raised and reared for their hides. It just doesn't make any commercial viability or sense. Uh, so what the leather industry does is it takes that kind of cast off from the meat industry and reuses it and turns it into, into a product. It's had a lot of, um, you know, it has a very high ostentatious value. People think of it as a very, very luxury product and it does a lot of cool stuff. So we've got to give leather some props and that's kind of where I started. So um, leather, PU top and, and, and then the substrate is the rawhide. So the cactus leather. So cactus leather is kind of one of the newest and greatest everybody's heard of the cactus leather. How is cactus leather made? Well, it has the exact same PU top coat. Okay, so so far the same as leather, but the difference is the substrate is different. So instead of it being an animal hide, it has a textile base layer, and then they kind of make like a cactus paste, okay? And that cactus paste goes into, uh, uh, goes on top of the base layer, and all of a sudden we have cactus leather. Of course, there are no spikes on it, so it's not gonna hurt you. Um, but that's essentially how the cactus leather is made. Now we have a new one called grape leather. So there's a company called Vigia that makes a, a grape leather product. And how is that made? Surprise, surprise, it's got a PU top coat. And it's got a textile base layer. Now, instead of a cactus paste, we've got grape paste. So we've got grape paste in the middle. So that's grape, or is it great? No, I forget. Terrible jokes. Now, the next one we have is pineapple leather. So this is, this is a new one. I actually really like this stuff, right? This is from a company called Pinatex. Um, they've actually done a lot of work on top coats. So instead of having a pure PU top coat, they've actually done a lot of research in, in making a, a more bio-based uh, top coat. Um, recent uh, sort of like public domain information about them, I think now they're at 95% of their top coat comes from bio-based uh, materials. Um, what's really interesting is that the back cloth, instead of it being pineapple paste over a regular fabric, what they do is they take the pineapple when they harvest it, and they, there's a skin that comes around it. And normally that skin is taken off and it's discarded, landfill and what have you. And what they do instead is they, they, they extract a fiber from it. The fibers maybe uh, make about two foot or so. They dry it out, the whole nine yards. And then in this scenario, what they do is they, they weave that into a fabric. Actually, they don't weave it, they, they, make, they use those long strands to needle punch it and they create kind of like a felt. When you see some of the samples, you'll, you'll see exactly what I mean. Um, so they're really using the, the core substance of the product really is from the pineapple. Um, this is about the truest of these kind of, you know, vegetable fruit products that, that, that is kind of sort of true to its aim. So I do quite like this product. I think it's quite, quite clever, really. And then we have mushroom leather. So, so that's another one that's always in the news. How does mushroom leather works? Well, it has surprisingly a textile back cloth. Um, it has a PU top coat, which is currently what they do is once they've made the product, they send it to, guess where, a tannery to finish it with the exact same PU top coat as we all use. Now, what about the mushrooms? Well, it's not like a mushroom sandwich. Uh, what they do is they grow mycelium. And this mycelium grows, um, they're able to grow it and harvest it in, in a mass-produced operation. And it kind of looks like, uh, like, a, like, a, like a wadding type material that you would find. It's a very, it's a kind of wispy, fibrous kind of material. And what they do is they sandwich that in between the base layer and the top coat. And that's what makes your mushroom leather, okay? Um, and then finally, biofabricated leather. So you might have heard of companies like Modern Meadow, for example. Uh, they started off trying to sort of DNA, replicate the DNA of a cow and then grow it. Um, they are probably the closest to, to genuine leather. What they do is they have a synthesized uh, protein base layer. So what they're trying to do is, is grow that, 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 that protein. And they initially started with, in effect, kind of like 3D printing uh, this biofabricated layer. Um, I think they got about as, as big as the, uh, the black sample there. It was about as big as they could ever make it. They've changed tack now and are doing it a slightly different way. Um, but the biofabrication process is pretty cool. But look, surprise, surprise, it's got a PU top coat again. Our friendly <laughs> neighborhood top coat. Um, so all of these things are kind of products that are in the works. And then finally, we have us and what we do. So we take a really different approach. 
So what I think is really interesting to compare is sometimes we think, hey, let's get all these novel things. Let's get, let's get cactus leather and pineapple leather and there's probably plum, there's actually mango leather, there's apple leather, not made by apple, but made of apples. Um, and, and all this while we've kind of, we talked about genuine leather still being a pretty, pretty cool old time product. Um, but synthetic leather has actually a lot of capability to be, to be, re be a really interesting next generation uh, sustainable product. So what we do uh, and how we do it a little bit different is that we have a back cloth, right? Just like all the other ones. But our back cloth now is made from a product called Tencel. And Tencel is a sustainable product that comes from wood pulp. Um, and it's, it, but it's the, the wood that we use is controlled. Um, it comes from an FRC certified forest background, all those kind of things. It's all very clearly documented how they make it. So it is a bio-based, sustainable and renewable and build at scale product, which is pretty cool. Now, the middle layer that we have, we have a foam layer that goes in between, which is why it's kind of soft and comfy. At the moment, we have been able to replicate this by removing some of the foam components and switching to a bio-based material. In addition, we've also got the final top coat, which we're working on a similar path that someone like Pinatex has done by making a more bio-based top coat as well. What this does is it currently puts our product at more than 50% sustainable renewable components within the product. Um, and the other added benefit is that our stuff actually is able to fly on an aircraft, whereas the other stuff kind of can't. So sometimes it's, it's, it's really interesting that we have all these new novel innovations, but sometimes what we need to do is go back to basics and say, what are they actually doing for us? Because a lot of these products like, like the grape leather, for example, what tangible benefit is the grape actually giving to the product? Is it there to, so you can say it's got a grape in it? Is the cactus there because you can say it's got a cactus in it? Is it actually improving the product or are we compromising? Um, we think that the best way forward is to build products without compromise. So our new bio-based product, for example, looks exactly the same as our regular products. It looks and feels the same so that you don't have this weird compromise kind of look, feel, aesthetic uh, and, and haptic. So, you know, are, are these novel products, are they really genuinely sustainable? I mean, think about a cactus, for example, okay? Bear this in mind. A cactus takes 10 years to grow one inch, one inch. So that's a lot of cacti we're gonna need and a lot of cacti we're gonna mow down to make a few yards of cactus leather. Whereas if we kind of refocus our efforts um, and use a lot of these ideas that people are generating, I think really what we need to do is kind of come together as a, as a kind of a village of people and collaborate together to make a genuinely more, more compatible, sustainable product. Um, the bio product, which is, which is launching pretty soon, um, it is, is rolling down pretty well. Um, but yeah, like I said, it takes a village. I think what we need to do is have constructive conversations with, with people like Modern Meadow, with people like uh, Milo from Bolt Threads, with Pinatex. They have some really, really good ideas. Are they ready to go inside an aircraft to fly next week, next month, next year? No, they're not. They're still a ways away. But I think what we need to do is to, is to kind of collaborate better use their innovation to see how we can bring them all together and have a genuinely sort of more sustainable end product. And if we do that, I think we've got, we've got a hope. Um, collaboration is the key. That is it for now. Thank you very much. So what I'm really interested, uh, thank you for both presentations from Caroline and, and, and Matthew, is, is you know, who's, who's asking for this? Who's interested in these solutions? Is it the airline? Is it the passenger? And I'm going to put it out there for any one of you to, to jump out. I know that Caroline has a point of view. She's looked at a lot of passenger data, but uh, and passenger perceived you know, demand. But um, does anybody else have a view on that as well? Well, um, just uh, a thought for that is, uh, from my perspective, it's a pure necessity, really. Um, so we need to do something to change something uh, to lower the impact on the environment. Um, and that's like the real requirement um, we're, we're uh, yeah, um, tackling here. Um, but obviously, I think uh, society, passengers, um, uh, governance, uh, every, everyone is asking more and more about it. And I think the aviation industry is still um, somewhat behind um, 
So, but that's, yeah, that's my opinion. I, I would add, so Lanzatech works kind of across industries and what we see when we look at these industries, who's asking for the change, a lot of it, part of it's coming from regulation saying that there's going to be a carbon tax and that's something that companies need to consider in order to improve their footprint. But a lot of it is also just coming from these companies themselves that are setting these targets. So what I'm seeing in the aviation space is that many companies are saying they're going to hit net zero by 2050. That means that we have to deal with the embedded carbon in the materials in these cabins that we're producing. So it doesn't really come from one place or the other, but by saying that you're going to get to net zero by 2050, that necessitates that you take a look at what is the carbon that's actually in the materials that you're producing. Yeah, we get, um, and we get a lot of questions from, um, passengers stroke customers, there just seems to be a really huge interest. And, and like I was alluding to in, in, in our session, um, it, it's kind of come a little bit out of the blue, to be honest. It was kind of nothing and now it's kind of everything. Um, and people want to know, they have a, this huge curiosity. Well, what am I getting? Why is it different? What does it do? Has it got spikes in it? All kinds of questions. We just get questions, 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 more so than at any other time. And I, I do feel like it's coming... It is coming from the OEMs. When I mean OEMs, I mean like, you know, the Rakaras and Safran's of this world. But I feel like it's coming more from the passenger. The passenger is curious right now and they want answers. They want to know what are we all doing about this problem? How are we solving it? That's, that's certainly what I hear. Yeah. I'm just going to add a point to say that um, the consumers are getting much more educated with progress that has been made across many other industries. And because of the nature of aviation, having to uh, take a longer time to launch things because of regulation and certifications, um, we can't afford to, to wait for that time. We can't afford uh, uh, launching things in five or 10 years time because the, the consumers and the passengers will be already much more far ahead in their journey. So we need to act a bit faster. <laughs> But I'm really encouraged, though, by the discussion today, I, you know, because, you know, I completely agree with you. The passenger is asking for this. But we've had so many discussions today that really point to the fact that we are all in this together. And there is a, a real kind of force for good here to, for, for going for change. So what are these solutions then? Should we delve into more of what the solutions are? What are these better solutions in terms of is it material or is it material process or is it both? I might put that to you. Sure. Um, so I'm, I would talk more about the material side of it. So when we look at embedded carbon and what does that actually mean? So if you look at the carbon footprint of a company, there is scope one, scope two, scope three of the types of emissions. And scope three is by and large the the biggest pot. That's that's the embedded carbon. That's where that sits in terms of the carbon footprint of a company. And so... There's, there's been a study done by the Nova Institute that shows that there's 550 million tons of embedded carbon in chemicals and materials. And for the most part, 88% of that is still coming from fossil fuels today. So it's really coming from oil and gas. If we want to deal with the embedded carbon in our materials, we need to see a dramatic shift away from below ground carbon and looking at above ground carbon. So what do I mean by that? It's not just one thing. Um, not just one thing is going to solve 550 million tons of embedded carbon, um, but that includes things like biosources. It includes recycling. So recycling will have to increase dramatically. But there's also a, a new class of materials that we're seeing, which is where Lanzatech operates. And that's by capturing emissions and using that CO2 as the building block for new materials. So you can think of it as recycling in a way, but we really need to be focusing on how do we utilize above ground carbon and lock that in new materials as opposed to digging up new resources and emitting that into the environment. So that's really where we see there's, it will take everything in order to address the scope of the problem that we're talking about. Um, but those are sort of the three main categories that we look at. Well, um, adding to that, um, I think, um, yeah, material is, is one, um, one, um, 
yeah factor to look at and um, Aeroflex for example um, is a bio-based composite mainly um, so um, as you said um, pulling fossil um, resources out of the earth crust uh, I, I don't think that's the future to go so um, bio-based bio materials um, are one option I, I believe so taking the um, the carbon out of uh, out of the atmosphere and and maybe at some point giving it back um, so have a have a circular approach there um, might be an option but um, I think especially in the uh, aviation and the um, aircraft uh, cabin interior um, area it's more complex because um, still or at this point we are still um, focusing on we have to focus on weight and um, so it's very specific um, to the use case and the component that we're looking at so for some components it might um, even be better to use um, as, uh, car carbon um, uh, fibers uh, at this point because they save so much more weight compared to other um, uh, materials. So at this point, um, this um, yeah translates um, to uh, kerosene savings and, and therefore um, CO two savings. So um, I think we have to very we have to be very specific um, in defining um, which way to go, or maybe there's uh, several ways. Um, to, to go forward in that area. Because the other question, um, our previous session talked about maybe reducing the material palette. You know, they were talking about more the onboard products and within the onboard products world, maybe you'd have a smaller number of materials that were certified and ready to use. Do you think that applies to the cabin? Should is that the approach we should take in the cabin? I'm not. I'm slightly playing the devil's advocate here because I don't necessarily believe it myself. But I'd love to know. I I believe so. I think we need to simplify our supply chains if we want to um, be more focused and achieve those efforts and really achieve those those targets. And as much as new technologies are presenting great opportunities, I really think we need that focus to be able to um, build new regulation, uh, build. Um, systems that we know work on a holistic manner um, and so part of it is yes we still need innovation and new technologies to thrive um, but I think simplifying the supply chain and see how we can use maybe um, homogenized designs or um, uh, uh, mono materials is something that I think is is quite interesting and um, something the automotive industry has very successfully uh, uh, applied yeah i largely agree with that i think though it has to be part of a bigger synergistic picture right so um we we talk about sustainability and then we all focus on the eco side but eco is one pillar of sustainability there's two other pillars as well there's the commercial viability the scalability there's the human element there's all these extra things that we need to consider so you know um like recycling everybody if you look up loads if you look up nike sustainability policy it's massive on just recycling 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 but what are you doing about the polyester that you're putting into all your yoga pants because that all comes from naphtha which is a derivative of oil there's no initiative at all to replace that do you, do you see any yoga pants that are not made of polyester these days no they're just not there um, so recycling, of course, is part is a good thing to do, upcycling, recycling, all those kind of things. But we've got to start moving away. That's why we've kind of seen a big emphasis. Well, what we're interested in is looking at these bio-based raw materials. And they need to be sustainable, not only from the environmental point of view, but from a harvest point of view. That's why I brought up the point about the cactus that it takes 10 years to grow one inch. What we need is weeds. Weeds are awesome. They just grow right. So stuff like bamboo, for example, is the fastest growing plant on the planet. So with the same amount of land and finite resource, you can grow a crap ton more bamboo than you can cacti, for example, and you're not burdening the resource at all. So now you've got a bio-based product, it's sustainable, you can scale it, all the good stuff, you replenish it. I mean, even trees to a degree are a slightly cagey subject because, you know, last time I checked, a tree didn't grow in 10 minutes, it's more like 10 plus years, right? So... You have to manage all of that infrastructure. Then you have to track it. Um, and then all of a sudden, we've got to certify it and all those kind of things. So it's quite a complex web. And I think overall, I think we've just got to have a better framework for what do we actually want that solves the problem? Does recycling solve it? No, it only solves, it only solves a 
portion of it. We need to fix the entire problem, just not little bits of it. And I think until we have that, I think that's been a common message throughout today. Until we get that common framework together, what are we trying to achieve? I don't think we're going to get a, a, a sensible solution until we get there. There's loads of really, really good work. We need someone like uh, like Boeing or Airbus put their arms around it and go, right, guys, this is what we're doing. Can we all go in the same direction, please? And that's what Green Cabin is kind of doing, right? So that's... But those are the paths, those are the initiatives, I think, that are gonna gonna get us to the to the end game, as it were. If I can maybe challenge a little bit your points on yoga pants, uh, actually, you can get them from things other made other than fossil. You can get them from carbon smart materials from Lanza Tech at H and M right now. Um, but <laughs> that being said, I, I, it has to do with both. I mean, recyclability is a big part of the solution. It's being able to actually put the materials that we already have back into use and give them a new life, and not looking at the end of life of a material as it being emitted into the environment, but actually being repurposed and reused. To to reduce the amount of raw materials we need to feed back into the system. And like I said, I think bio is a big part of that solution. And actually, you can even find bio in yoga pants, too. Um, so you can take bioethanol. Um, but you could take bioethanol, convert that into monoethylene glycol, one of the two building blocks of um, polyester fibers. So... Um, I, it has to do with both. It has to do with where are your materials coming from, like, but it also has to do with how do you treat the end of life of a material and recyclability is a way to make the end of life of a material, the beginning of life of a new material. So it is that thing that we talked about earlier. It is about the material and the process. You can't divorce the two. You have to look at material in context, how you use it, where you're using it from. I love the question we had in the previous session about the plastic bottles versus co coffee cups with Delta and, and KLM. There wasn't a right answer or a wrong answer. There was just look it in, in the context, in the round, which is what you say. And I'd love to hear you talk about the recycling of the potentially of even aviation dress covers that we talked about. I mean, I'd love to share this with the audience as quickly as possible. So. Um, sure. So, um what we're talking about is that Lanza Tech te technology can also use solid waste. So it can take solid waste streams, gasify them into a syngas, and then feed it into the gas fermentation reaction to produce ethanol, again, as the building block for new materials. So we actually have a partnership, um, for example, with Nexchem in Rome, in Italy, and we'll be using the municipal solid waste of the municipality of Rome in order to then gasify it, ferment it, and make ethanol as a new building block. So that doesn't just apply to municipal solid waste, could apply to an end-of-life air plane as well or aircraft or whatever materials are there. Um, so, re I mean, you can tell why I care so much about recycling because it really is the core of, of what we do is focusing on using waste streams and the recyclability, creating a recycled carbon economy. Gasified is my new favorite expression <laughs> from today. <laughs> But I think it's its own hashtag. I think to your point, it's material processes and end of life. I don't think we can disconnect those three elements. Otherwise, we we just going to continue applying everything in a linear way, and that's that's not possible if we want to reach our targets. And and also, you know, today's there is no silver bullet. It, there is a combination of processes and materials that creates that silver bu bullet in in conjunction. And I think that's what you, you all have testified to. At this point, are there any questions in the audience? Can I, any, I can see a hand up behind there. Thank you so much. Say who you are. All right, hi. Uh, my name is Aaron Yong. I'm a designer with Lyft. We're a design consultancy based in Tokyo and Singapore. Uh, my question is, Primarily for Carolyn, but I guess anyone can jump in. Uh, what do you think the, I mean, we deal with a lot of CMF design and that's a lot of our work is in that as well for airlines. Um, I guess my question is, where do you see our role as designers in the process um, in terms of advancing sustainability, given that a lot of the advancements in that, uh, in material science and innovation, they're in the hands of the suppliers and not... Uh, the designer and we basically work with what is available to us and so outside of being acutely aware of what we can do and what's out there and what's good for the environment 
um, you know, is there much that we can do in the process as designers on, say, on an airline program? Yeah, I to, think you a, know. a big um, value of the CMF index that I shared earlier is the fact that we fostered relationship with the suppliers. So the resource accounts for more than a hundred at the at the minute. I think it's more than a hundred different suppliers that we partnered or partnered, verified. Um, but what we're able to do is then go back to those people, knowing their processes, the way in which they operate, their supply chain, um, and also tell them, well, look, we're working with this specific client or with this specific airlines, and these are their goals, uh, these are their uh, regulations, certifications, and really drive change and push them for innovation because we know we can't really wait for um, necessarily a brief to come uh, for them to then be able to apply those new um, innovations because we only get, what, six months sometimes <laughs> to design a whole new cabin. So um, I think fostering those relationships and always at Simrapal, we always try and uh, be in touch with them, share what we see as part of the progress across different industries uh, to really try and push on their side for new R&D developments or um, innovation programs. Um, so I think as a CMF designers, that's one of the things we can surely do. Maybe to add from, from my perspective on that, um, I think we're, we all agree that collaboration um, when it comes to sustainability is um, the most important thing for our, for our uh, industry. And I, I think everyone has to, to play um, his role. And uh, I think um, designing and uh, probably the, the Green Alliance as well, um, you, you might play a role in connecting um, the, the different players and showing them um, how to approach this and uh, how to... Um, yeah, meet the requirements that might um, yeah come from from passengers and uh, and users. So I, I think that's your strong suit. One of the actually a good example of to illustrate that when we worked on the Virgin Galactic uh, seat, so we developed a three D knit um, sock, if you like, that uh, was used as a upholstery for uh, the seats. And what we did was uh, partnering with both Virgin Galactic, Under Armour and our own studios, but also suppliers that we worked with in the past on 3D Nets to really develop the solutions that was readily available um, and passed all the standards uh, that required to fly in space. But you need to yeah, gather those knowledges and gather different expertises to be able to make this knowledge available and maybe less being a bit less defensive of, um, you know, Uh, intellectual properties and things like this because we're all going to learn from each other and uh, that's the only way we're going to be able to um, act at pace I think sharing sharing the knowledge any other questions in the audience any other um, not many hands up anyway so I'll have another question so so how do we make this possible how do we push our industry to certify some of these new materials or, or new processes And I think it's, you know, referred to as the holy grail in, in, in one of the previous. Um. Well, we touched on it a little bit towards the end, end of mine. Even. It's, um, I think it's about collaboration, right? So, so we, we, we have a, what we believe is a sustainable product that has uh, a roadmap, blah, blah, blah. But, but why wouldn't we be talking to Pinatex or, or Deserto, who makes the cactus? Uh, and why wouldn't we look to integrate that into our own products? Um, as you already saw, there's a lot of commonality between different products, right? So everybody's using the same PU top coats. Everybody's pretty much using a substrate of some description. Why can't we all get together and try and work for a common good? Because, for example, there is now uh, a sustainable renewable PU, for example, equivalent, that's really highly renewable sustainable. But people complain then that, oh, yeah, but it's really expensive and it's not as available, so it comes at a premium. But that's only because it hasn't scaled yet and it hasn't scaled yet why it kind of goes back to your question that not enough knowledge not enough people are asking for it not enough demand therefore price is higher right so you know maybe we all share those developments and then all of the products get better not just some of them um in one of our sessions with chris brady from unum um it doesn't need to be what he was saying was you know it doesn't need to be a specific aerospace only you know, kind of sustainability thing. It needs to be an everyone sustainability thing. And we all need to collaborate to jointly make it better. Um, how do we drop our guard a little bit from IP and all those kind of things? That's a much bigger question, probably for a different day. But um, collaboration, it's got to be the way. Thank you. And I completely agree with you.
Yeah, I, I like the um, the statement of um, one of the earlier sessions saying um, sustainability is not cost; it's an investment in the future. Um, and I think um, this, for me at least, transfers. Um, we need um, um, a change of, of mindset in our industry. So um, to to put sustainability first, um, it needs. Uh, awareness on all levels i i believe and um for this um i think we're we're talking about this here um to achieve this goal um but um also um on other on all other channels we need to um put out that message and convince people um um that yeah we 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 uh need to to meet the uh, requirements that our environment gives us so I also just want to echo a point that Caroline made in her presentation, which is you can also learn from other industries. Um, and I think that's really powerful when you look at like t the textile space, for example, and you gave a lot of examples of textiles, how that can be applied to the airline industry as well. Because I see that working with textiles, I'm using the same products when I'm talking to the automotive industry. And so that's how we've been able to scale is going across industry, but there's a lot of learnings that you can have across industry. It doesn't just need to be an innovation that you're finding in aviation. You can borrow ideas from other industries as well to be able to move faster in that journey. I think that wraps it up, doesn't it? So collaboration, open mindset, changing the, the context in which we operate and um, looking forward to a brighter future. Yeah, it's a bit like Elon making all of his patents for battery technology, you know, openly available and free to use, right? It's for the common good. Yeah. Um, and I think a bit more of that kind of mentality is probably what's going to get us to our, to our end destination. So. so to the panel, can we... Give a warm welcome or a warm thank you and to the sponsors of...